Hello and welcome to the Smart City IoT demo. Let's start by defining and introducing the Smart City Network or CityNet. What we are looking at here is ALE's reference architecture for smart cities. The Smart City Network provides network services to government agencies, businesses, residents and visitors. The CityNet plays a pivotal role in implementing smart city use cases such as smart lighting and video surveillance to name a few. The CityNet is the spinal cord that connects the IoT devices such as sensors with cloud-based applications that control them and analyze their data. In this demo, we will focus on some of the challenges in smart city networks. First, how to provision thousands of network nodes and headless IoT devices, and how to do this securely and remotely. Second, how to map an IoT device to its container, for instance, how to map video cameras to the security container and smart lighting devices to a lighting container. How to do this automatically and securely for thousands of devices. Third, how to protect from unauthorized access at the network edge. In a smart city network, the network edge could be a cabinet on the side of the road where physical security is not always easy to enforce. Fourth, how to protect from malicious attacks such as eavesdropping, man-in-the-middle or impersonation attacks. And fifth, how to isolate devices which become compromised or unsafe. We will refer to this scenario to illustrate these challenges and how to tackle them. This is a smart light pole scenario. The pole incorporates smart lighting, security cameras and various environmental sensors. Rugged Omni Switch 6465s are installed within a cabinet on the side of the road and connect the smart pole to the city net. There is a technician who will install the switch and connect the devices. A hacker who will attempt multiple attacks on the network. And certain servers and applications to provision, configure and run the network from the operations center. Let's start with the first challenge, which is the provisioning of the network nodes. When there's thousands of switches to provision, how to reduce provisioning time, cost and errors? The answer is the OmniSwitch remote configuration download feature. The technician only needs to unbox the factory default switch, mount it and plug power and uplinks. There's no need to connect a laptop or copy files from a USB drive, etc. The technician requires no networking skills. By automatically provisioning network edge nodes, the smart city saves time and cost. Let's see how the auto remote configuration download feature works. When the blank switch boots up, it will try to get an IP address through the SCP. It will attempt to use the untucked native VLAN or tagged VLAN 127. It can also try this on a different VLAN, which the upstream switch can inform through LLDP. The DHCP server would provide the IP address of a TFTP server and the name of an instruction file through the DHCP options. The switch will then contact the TFTP server and download the instruction file. The instruction file contains details of firmware, configuration file and how to download them from an SFTP server. Last, the switch will use the information in the instruction file to download its firmware and configuration from the SFTP server. The configuration file can contain all the configuration or just a basic template such that the configuration can be finalized remotely from the NOC. What we see on the screen is some of the console output during the remote configuration download sequence. Here we see that the switch got IP address 192.168.13.3 and was directed to use TFTP server 192.168.2.192 and download instruction file instruction.alu. The instruction file points the switch to download configuration file 6465.iot.cfg. No firmware was downloaded because the switch is already running the specified release. Finally, the RCD sequence completed successfully and the switch will reboot from the working directory. There's a few additional steps to perform before the switch can be managed from the NOC. The downloaded configuration file includes MagSec on the uplink. 
After the switch reboots, we need to enable MagSec on the other side of the link. Once we do that, we will be able to manage the switch remotely and certify its configuration. On OmniVista, we will run Enable Discovery so the new switch is manageable and shows on the map. All this is done remotely from the NOC, not by the field technician. In OmniVista, we will run a discovery to manage the new switch. We will choose a range which is pre-configured with SNMP version 3 parameters and start the discovery. We wait for the network to be discovered. And finally, we see the newly discovered switch at the bottom of the list. We can now go to the topology map and the new switch is showing. Having provisioned the switch, the next step is to provision the IoT devices. Provisioning an IoT device for the first time entails upgrading its software, changing default user credentials, and configuring network and other parameters. In addition, a certificate must be installed or the device's MAC address must be whitelisted for it to successfully authenticate to the network. These tasks can be performed in different ways. For instance, the device can be connected on a separate provisioning network before dispatching to the field. In this demo, we will show a way of remotely provisioning devices after they have been dispatched and installed on the field, fresh out of the box, using certificates. We will leverage the Access Guardian authentication framework. Let's see how we have configured Access Guardian on the Access switch. Access Guardian is configured to use 802.1x authentication and fall back to MAC authentication for those devices that don't support or are not configured for 802.1x, the non-supplicants in the 802.1x terminology. When a fresh, out-of-the-box, and provisioned IoT device is first connected, it will fail both 802.1x and MAC authentication. A restricted UMP is applied. In this restricted role, the device is able to obtain an IP address, an SSH from a jump host is allowed so the device can be updated, configured, and its certificate can be installed. After the certificate is installed and the device is rebooted or the port is toggled, 802.1x authentication will be successful and the device will be assigned to a different UMP role returned by RADIUS. In this demo, the IoT device is a video camera and its role is IoT video. We will configure Access Guardian to assign the restricted role in any other situation. For instance, the authentication fails or authentication is successful but no valid role is returned. Furthermore, we will enable MAC authentication as fallback mechanisms for those devices that do not support 802.1x authentication. In that case, the failed authentication record shows the MAC address that needs to be whitelisted. Containment at the access switch is VLAN based. VLAN containers are mapped to SPB containers at the backbone switch. The restricted container maps to VLAN 15 and the IoT video container maps to VLAN 16. These containers apply access policies and bandwidth caps as shown. In the restricted profile, DHCP, DNS, ARP, ICMP, and SSH from a provisioning jump host are allowed, but anything else is blocked. This is so that the device can obtain an IP address and we can configure it from the jump host using SSH. Bandwidth is limited to 1 Mbps. Similarly, the IoT video profile allows communication with the video subnet as well as other basic protocols, but anything else is blocked. A bandwidth cap of 10 Mbps is applied. Let's review all that starting with the Access Guardian flow. As we can see, the flow uses 802.1x and MAC authentication is used for non supplicants. When either 802.1x or MAC is successful and the valid profile is returned, the return UMP is applied. In any other case, the restricted UMP is applied. 
This includes failed authentication, unreachable radio server, or successful authentication that returns an invalid profile, such as one that is not defined on the switch. Let's now review the restricted and IoT video profiles. The restricted profile applies policies contained in the restricted policy list and applies a bandwidth cap of 1 Mbps. The IoT video profile applies policies contained in the video policy list and the bandwidth cap of 10 Mbps. Finally, let's review the policies contained in the policy lists such as SSH, DNS, BootP, ARP, ICMP, the default policy and the video policy. and we can now verify which policies are contained within each policy list. The technician will simply plug the device to any access port on the switch. He will then inform the NOC when he's finished. Because the IoT device is fresh out of the box and no certificates have been installed and its MAC address has not been whitelisted, it will fail both 802.1x and MAC authentication and the restricted UMP profile will be applied. Before we can connect to the device and configure it, we need to know its IP address. So let's find out what IP address it got. We can use OmniVista's locator for that. We will browse devices connected to the switch that we provisioned earlier. We select the switch and we see there's one device connected to it. If we now click on classification, we verify the UMP is restricted and the VLAN is 15. Now clicking on layer 3 will show the IP address is 192.168.15.2. With this information, we can now go to the jump host and SSH to the IoT device. So that's what I'm going to show you next. In the demo, the IoT device is actually a Raspberry Pi with a camera module. Once we have connected to the device using SSH from the jump host, we have to perform certain tasks such as a software upgrade, password change, certificate install, to the one net configuration, and other configurations. In the demo, we will only focus on to the one x configuration and certificate installation. In order to do this, we have created a script configure.sh, which copies the certificate in .p12 format and also configures the network interface for 802.1x authentication using IPTLS. After executing the script, we will reboot the device. After the certificate is installed and the device is rebooted, authentication succeeds and the device is assigned the IoT video role. Once again, we use OmniVista Locator to verify. So there we go, that's our device. If we now click on classification, we verify the profile is now IoT video and the VLAN 16. And clicking on layer 3 shows the IP address is 192.168.16.2. The Raspberry Pi is set up as a video camera, so we can stream the video to subnet 14. We can use a browser to watch the live video. All we need to do is enter the device's IP address and port 8081, which the device is using to stream video. And here we see the video of a demo room in Singapore. Now going back to the list of challenges, we have shown how network nodes and IoT devices can be remotely and securely provisioned. We have also shown how different IoT devices are mapped to different IoT containers thanks to the user network profile. Let's now show how the network can prevent unauthorized access at the network edge. Now IoT devices such as IP cameras are provisioned with certificates and with that they successfully authenticate to the network and are mapped to the right container. What would happen if a hacker were to gain physical access to the switch and try to connect his own device? If he did that, his device would fail authentication and would be mapped to the restricted container. 
in the restricted container, the device is well restricted and unable to reach critical resources. Therefore, this attack is a fail. With that, we have shown how Access Guardian stops unauthorized access at the edge, but hackers may try other things, such as eavesdropping, man in the middle, or impersonation attacks. Let's see how the network will protect against those attacks. Let's now imagine the hacker wanted to sniff the uplink traffic with a network tap. He somehow manages to connect a tap on the uplink and tries to capture traffic. He looks at the packet capture, but all he can see is MagSec encrypted traffic. So once again, this attack has failed. Our hacker may imagine a different kind of attack instead. Our hacker knows that user ports can be secure with network admission control, but our hacker also knows that there's no network admission control on uplink ports. So he imagines an attack in which he will connect his own switch in between the access switch and the network. All he has to do is tag all VLANs on both ports, and with that, he should be able to sniff and also inject or modify traffic without having to worry about NAC, right? Well, wrong, because his switch does not have the MAXEC keys. He cannot sniff traffic because it's encrypted as we saw before, and he cannot inject traffic either because he's missing the keys and his traffic will be dropped at the other end. Again, this attack is also a fail. We have seen how the network protects data integrity and confidentiality by blocking eavesdropping, man in the middle, and impersonation attacks with MACSEC. A different kind of attack may be launched from the device itself, due to a virus, for instance. Let's see how the network can protect from that too. Now, hackers will attempt to use the IoT devices to launch a distributed denial of service attack. The devices are infected with a worm and have become a bot to launch the attack. We will show how the network can detect an attack coming from the IoT device and quarantine it. Once the attack is detected, the device will be placed in the restricted role and container again. In this container, it can do no damage and the worm can be cleaned up. Because the devices are in a restricted container, the attack won't be successful. So once again, the attack is a fail. Let's see Quarantine Manager in action to illustrate this. We will simulate an attack coming from the IoT device with the Nmap tool. Using Nmap, we will launch a scan against the subnet where video servers are located. We configure the target and parameters through the command line. And the attack starts. Let's see how the attack is detected and thwarted with Quarantine Manager. First, in Nomnivista, we go to the Notifications application. We see several critical alarms have been raised. There are DOS notifications coming from the switches. We expand the description in one of the alarms and see the IP and MAC addresses of the device that the attack is coming from. This happens to be the address of the IoT device, the Raspberry Pi, in this demo. We can now go to the Quarantine Manager application and clicking on Band reveals that the device has been placed in the quarantine role. Finally, we have shown how the network can automatically isolate unsafe or compromised devices with denial of service detection and quarantine manager. Thank you for watching.